Home Resources, a place you can depend on for all your home ownership needs. My name is Kathleen Godot, your real estate concierge, and I am excited to share with you how to maintain, update, and protect your investments. You know, just the other day I saw this line, it said, our relationship with plants can make us healthier and happier. And that really stuck with me. So I went searching for a landscaper that really knew how to respect what this had to say. And I found a wonderful gentleman, his name is Nathan Fournier. Welcome, Nathan. I'm so excited to have you. You are the CEO of Home Harvest of Central Mass. Is that correct? That is correct. Awesome. And I love the fact that you advertise yourself as edible landscape and construction. Um, so I'm so excited to learn more about this. Tell us your story. How did you get there? Sure, sure. Yeah, so I've pivoted a few times in my career mm -hmm. in the lifelong pursuit of trying to figure out what it is, what is our purpose? What do yeah. you really want to do with your life? And so I had a pretty direct route from high school, going to vocational high school. I'm a huge advocate of vocational schools and their computer aided design program. Mm -hmm. Went on to WPI as a mechanical and astronautic engineer. Worked in the industry for a few years and a few different businesses that I just never found that spark in there my was no heart. Click. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I love the design process and I love thinking through a problem and coming up with solutions and getting creative. And so I've always loved that and the computer aided modeling aspect of it. Yep. And it was actually a couple years after I graduated college where I had an hour long commute and you know, I turned my car into my university on wheels. And I listened yeah. to tons of audiobooks and podcasts on all different kinds of things from personal development and goal setting to yeah. how to start a business and just exploring different interests that I had. And I came across this one podcast and one word stuck out to me from that podcast and the word was permaculture. Mm, that's a cool word. Yeah, and so it, it has a few different meanings, but really it's this ability to design a permanent culture. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that is rooted in agriculture. So what right. does a permanent agriculture look like? And I was coming at this from a little more of a pessimistic angle. It was on like sure. a survivalist podcast, yeah. you know? And so I was looking at the state of the world and look, just recognizing the fragility of mm -hmm. all of the infrastructure that we have. And like, right. what does it take to get food on the shelves? Shipping across oceans and electricity and credit card machines and Especially all. Especially after COVID and everything that we've gone through. So yeah. COVID was a huge wake up call, I think for a lot of people and just right. recognizing that fragility and like, we can't depend on the grocery stores to always have food stocked. And what happens if not? Right. It's a terrifying premise. <laughs> right. So this word permaculture really took that pessimism and flipped it on its head to this beautiful, optimistic outlook of something that we can do in our own homes to make a very strong, positive impact, not, not only on the world, but also uh, to create more resilience within ourselves. Right. And isn't that how we started out as farmers? And It sure was. And it's only been, you know, a hundred years since like, if you didn't grow your own food, you didn't eat. Right, right. <laughs> and so we've lost that connection. And there's a lot of philosophical, philosophical connection to nature that we've lost as well and where our food comes from. Mm -hmm. Never mind the nutritional benefits, you know, the psychological power of growing your own food, planting a seed, watching it grow and harvesting that vegetable and allowing that to nourish you. Even is Walking and sitting amongst nature helps with anxiety and all of the behavioral issues that we're experiencing right now. Absolutely. And more and more research comes out every day proving that. Mm. So yeah, this idea of permaculture, and it's really defined as a design science, mm. mimicking mother nature and recognizing all the beautiful symbiotic relationships between all living things on this planet that have evolved over a billion years. And right from the microbiology in the soil up to the plants, to the animals, and to the cosmos. And, and how we're all connected. We're how together. we're all connected, yep. And so now it's looking at you know, an ecosystem, a natural forest, yep. and saying, okay, how do we take the elements of design within that forest, with the ultimate designer, and how do we incorporate those lessons into the way that we create our societies? And so yep. how do we support the ecology and all those natural systems while providing our own needs as well? So what's interesting is we've been talking now for a few minutes, and I'm not sure the viewers even know what your, your business is. And I'm, I want to tell them, you're, you do landscaping and homescaping, and, um, and that's what I was searching for. And I was so amazed by your approach to it. Um, what makes you, obviously this makes you unique, but what makes your services unique when you're talking with clients? Definitely, and it's hard to grasp sometimes. I, I define it as edible and ecological landscaping. Yep. And people are like, oh, cool. But you know, there's a, a little bit of a glaze mean? over their eyes. Yeah. So what we do is our bread and butter, we build raised garden beds. We consult and educate people how to grow their own vegetables. We have our own fruit tree nursery. And so we plant backyard orchards and berry bushes and 
convert lawns into wildflower meadows and some eco micro clover uh, lawn alternatives that require yeah. less mowing, less chemicals, less water, and more sustainable landscape design. So getting back to the natural look of how probably our earth looked before we got into manicuring lawns and right. all of that. Well, how would I get started if I was calling you and, and this actually did happen? What would happen, um, how, how does that get started? Where, where, where do we start? Yeah, so going to the website's the first place again because it's hard to visualize and conceptualize a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. Our website's excellent with a lot of great pictures of, of what this really means and what it looks like in reality. And so going to the website and then getting a feel for the services, but then submitting a form through there, we schedule a consultation. And that mm -hmm. consultation process is a really important step because the yeah. first rule of permaculture is to observe and to interact with nature. And so we go to your landscape, we walk around your, your yard and think big, you know, what does a 10 year dream landscape look for you? And if you already have ambitions to grow your own food or you already have started and you want to expand, there's a few different approaches we take, but you know, we look at sunlight exposure and, and water management yeah. and uh, where most landscapers might, you know, take a gutter and plumb it straight to the sewer. We're yeah. going to take that gutter, put it in a rain barrel, have the overflow feed into a dry Creek bed and then into a rain garden yeah. and all that's going to be planted with beautiful native plants and edible plants hidden in and amongst those landscapes. And so a big part of the design is really creating a forageable landscape where it looks beautiful, it's aesthetic, but then you walk around and you can pick berries and fruits and vegetables all throughout. Yeah, and that is so cool. And what's interesting is being in real estate, I, we focus on the house and the building of the house, and then the landscaping gets like no attention at all. And, and we're left with what do we do with this space and, and how do we make it... Um, feasible for us. Um, I would be afraid for you to come to my house. <laughs> my landscaping is so bad and um, probably it's better. It's a blank palette, right? That you can help me vision what it might look like. And I think that's key. That really does make you unique because um, <clears throat> most of us sometimes know what we want, but there's so many things that you've said just up till now that um, is making me think about what are some things that I could consider that maybe I didn't consider because we didn't have the conversation. What are some of your, um, and I know you traveled abroad, right? You did some exploration to prepare for this. Where were some of the places that you went to learn about the, the sustainability of this? Yeah, definitely. It's really cool to get that bigger perspective from different right. cultural avenues. And a lot of this comes back to indigenous wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so I spent some time in Hawaii and in toward a couple different regenerative agriculture farms out there, right. which is a very well correlated philosophy to how we do it in our landscapes versus how we do it on a larger farm scale. But just unbelievable knowledge, you know, of, yeah. of companion planting and soil health and no chemicals, no pesticides, right. but being able to use waste streams from other industries like a fishing uh, market where then they have all these leftover fish. And that's a really high quality nitrogen rich fertilizer that we can then incorporate into the farms. And so being able to see how these systems interact and how that wisdom was passed on from generations was really amazing. Right. And then also, seeing how the colonial era of European domination over these landscapes wiped out so much of that knowledge right. and just deforested the land and planted grass for hay. And uh, it, we lost a lot of that diversity and that wisdom. Then after Kauai, I went to New Zealand and I spent six months there and um, I've always wanted to go to New Zealand. And it was, again, the quintessential, most beautiful landscape in the world. Yeah. So while I was there, I lived and worked on this regenerative agriculture farm in this eco-village community setting where I helped manage their food forest. Right. And I worked in their tree nursery where they were grafting different heritage varieties of fruit trees, these long lost forgotten varieties that you're not gonna find in the grocery store shelf. Right. Because all the varieties that are on the store have been bred to be able to ship across the ocean. Right, mass and, production, right? Yeah, and, and just the, um, so they haven't been bred for disease resistance, they've been bred for, uh, they don't get bruised easily so they can again withstand the, right. the shipping um, process and so yeah so there's a lot of really beautiful varieties of different vegetables and fruits that we've kind of forgotten and there's a great movement now of a lot of backyard gardeners citizen scientists yeah. uh, breeding their own varieties to to really create that resiliency and the robustness where they don't need to spray the chemicals anymore. Right. And that's a romantic thing of growing organic fruit trees where if you're gonna plant some of the most common varieties, like you have to do something to prevent the most common disease and pests because that genetic 
diversity hasn't been bred into that. Right, just like in humans, when we when we have infection coming about, we we have to um, protect ourselves. What what um, what are some of your favorite plants for New England planting? Because you know, obviously. Um, the challenge, I think, in New England is understanding what to plant for what season and how to keep it low maintenance, if you will. Definitely. Low maintenance is a huge factor, and that's yeah. a, a big draw. For me. <laughs> a big draw for most people, again, because landscaping, it, because we plant all these exotics that don't belong right. here, and so they require a lot more water and nutrition and right. special pruning practices to make it look in a perfect sphere where there are other native plants, the other shrubs that have a beautiful natural form. You don't have to prune it. It belongs here. It's already right. adapted to the soil. You don't have to fertilize it. You don't have to water it, and it has a very nice aesthetic as well. So there is a big movement, a lot more native plants. Um, some of the varieties. I love, especially on the fruit side, yep. that most people don't know about. Like a pawpaw is a really cool native fruit tree that really? is actually what in... Really? What does it yeah, resemble? It, so it's actually in like the mango family, but it mm, is hardy up to New England. And it grows in, in... It can survive in part shade, which is pretty rare for a fruit tree. Most need full sun. But it's, uh, it's they call it the Native American banana. And oh, so it's, uh, it's like a, a mango, banana, custard, uh, really cool fruit. And it has big, broad leaves, like a yeah. tropical looking leaf that turn blaze orange in the fall. So they have a beautiful aesthetic as well. And they just have no pest or disease issues compared to most other fruit trees. Interesting, because I, you know, you and I first started talking about fruit trees, because that was my um, way to bring beauty to the art. Because fruit, the fruit is beautiful, but then you also have the flowers and the other things that come with the fruit trees. Um, how about ground covers? What's your favorite ground cover for New England? Yeah, so my philosophy, especially with garden design, is uh, to have a living ground cover as often as possible. Mm -hmm. Right now we're so used to this massive 5,000 square, 1,000 square foot mulch bed yeah. with a couple shrubs. And mm -hmm. then we have to reapply that mulch every year and we have to weed it and we have yeah. to put so much energy into our red dyed mulch, you know, that people love. And so our philosophy is much different, where we plant our plants much closer together, and yeah. we have a shrub layer that's taller in, in the background, leading down to perennial layer, herbaceous perennials, more of that mid-level, and then the ground cover filling in all the space underneath and between. Right. And so we like to plant a little bit more densely than even the product a lot of the tags recommend to create that nice cottage garden feel, and yeah. we design for bloom uh, overlapping so that throughout the seasons you get different blooms with different swaths of color that right. really complement each other and create a wonder and, and seasonal interest. Um, and then the ground cover is really important. We love strawberry as a ground cover, and so there's a lot of different, you know, the most common like edible strawberries that we see um, have much bigger fruit, but they don't propagate quite as much vegetatively, right. whereas there are some other native fruit tree, uh, other, um, yeah, native strawberries that are more of like a woodland, an alpine strawberry or a woodland strawberry, where they have the little little tiny strawberries. Right, right, those. they're just little teeny, teeny. Those work really well to create a nice green carpet uh, yeah. and, and cover the space. And so that's kind of our philosophy is, you shouldn't see mulch for more than three years. Yeah. So we like to add as many plants as we can, and hopefully that ground cover will fill that space. It'll shade the lower soil so that weeds don't pop up after the fall and the plants die back, they add that natural fertility in, in back into the soil. And then when everything re-sprouts, they out can be the weeds. And it's like this beautiful landscape that then you don't have to mulch, you don't have to weed, and it creates this really nice All right, you sold me on that. I hate weeding. That is <laughs> like the worst. Um, what are some of the projects you do? Let's just outline some of the projects. I, I think the viewers have a great idea of um, the beauty that you can bring to their property, but you also do other projects. Um, so tell us a little bit more about some of those things. Yeah, so again, we really like to take a holistic approach to landscape design. And with my engineering background and the 3D modeling, I have a great software where I can 3D render your whole landscape. And again, imagining it 10 years down the road, uh, you know, maybe you want a nice bluestone patio here in, in a fieldstone retaining wall, and then a pergola on top with a fire pit and an outdoor kitchen, right. and um, all these different elements that most people, you know, you're not gonna afford necessarily all at once. Right. And so we create that long-term 
unphased approach where we're developing a relationship with you and the landscape, which is really important. Um, and then, yeah, so we, we kind of handle everything. And so I you know, had some experience uh, renovating houses as a, as a general contractor. I got into carpentry and construction, and I love that. We have our awesome uh, in in-house wood shop. And so we build a lot of chicken coops, rabbit hutches, raised beds as like our bread and butter, um, arbors and pergolas, and yeah. there's just a really sensational feeling of having a nice, beautiful cedar arbor that creates a threshold into the garden. And right. you plant grapes along it, or clematis flowering vines, yeah. or even hardy kiwi we can grow here. Really? Walking <laughs> underneath an arbor with fruit dangling down, and you step into the garden, and yeah. it's full of life and abundance, and really creating that sensational garden, which is really like we would to focus on. Between bright colors, the sounds of the birds and the bees, the yeah. texture of the different plants, the tastes, of course, and you just get this really overwhelming sensation of peace in these gardens. It it is very it is very peaceful most of the properties that i have that have garden spaces that um that create that that romantic feel that you just described um it, it's like a separate room um outside of your house where we go to hang out so it is really important that we optimize the full property as well as the interior um so the raised vegetable beds, and you mentioned education. Um, that was one of the conversations we had because I'm getting ready to do a deck, and I wanted to, my husband was a gardener and is limited. So the raised, flower, the raised um, vegetable beds is something I think he can handle. You'll actually help build them, plant them, and then educate on how to maintain them. Is that what I heard you say? Yeah. Yep. yeah. <laughs> Don't want to put words in your mouth. I just sure. want to make sure I have an understanding. And it spans the gamut. Some people are really excited and, and have some existing knowledge of gardening, yep. but you know maybe they're growing in ground, which right. is it, it's doable, of course, but of co in, in, in a city, there's a lot of lead in the soil, there's right. a lot of weed pressure, and you don't really know what used to be there, so we do a lot of soil testing as well, but building a raised bed is so nice because you just start with a perfect soil mix right, right off the bat, and then you have a little bit more height too, so you're not on your hands and knees digging in, right. and so I love raised beds, and then as far as the education aspect, you know, sometimes we can do anything from just building the beds and you're on your own, yeah. or we can do a full garden layout, a full plan, yeah. educate you about companion planting and successional cropping. And, uh, and being able to develop a whole plan for the season. And that might be a deliverable as just a plan for right. you. Or you can just hire us and we'll come out every other week and we'll plant, we'll maintain, we'll uh, replant, we'll train up trellises and so take care of So you're a partner in the process. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, what are some tips that you can share with the viewers about um, how to move toward a healthier garden? Is there anything that you can give them, one, two, or three tips? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of different, really small actions that we all can take to make a massive positive impact on this planet. One is waste reduction. So thinking about composting. We build a lot of compost bins in our wood shop as well. And so we have smaller vermicomposting bins, which are actually worm bins that mm -hmm. break down your food scraps. And I have a small bin right in my kitchen. Yeah. And it's so nice and really convenient. Interesting. And then larger landscape composting bins for all your leaves at the end of the season. And um, Yeah, that's a huge problem. Yeah, we, we have a lot of leaves here in New England, and that's, yeah. you know, we're pretty lucky, really, climate wise, where we're at, because we can grow lots of things, almost everything except for the tropical, you know, citrus and mangoes and avocados, unfortunately. We can't, we can't grow those here. But that's one simple thing is the compost. Is, is one small thing. And then growing any amount of your own food. I mean, it doesn't take much to have one, like a four by eight raised bed, um, really just for practice. You know, I think uh, one of our core values is resilience. And, you know, our core values rooted in resilience. And so what does resilience mean to you? There's a lot of different ways that can be interpreted. And I think that having the knowledge of how to grow your own food creates a sense of security within mm -hmm. yourself. I know that I can provide for me and my family yep. in time of crisis. Or um, a resilient ecology and recognizing that we're in the sixth mass extinction for pollinator decline. It's really mm -hmm. bad with all the chemicals we're spraying. We're, we're killing a lot of our pollinators. And if we don't have pollinators, we don't have farms and we don't right. have food. And so it's a really important thing where we can 
plant more native plants in our landscapes and just a couple here and there. You don't necessarily need a full-blown landscape design and having it all done at once. You know, I think being engaged in that process and learning as you go, doing the research, just a couple small plants, reducing our lawns a little bit. I know that we love our perfectly manicured grass lawns mm -hmm. here in the States. And I think that there's a new paradigm shift where people recognize they're useless. You know, we have yeah. a small space, we can play with the kids. And they take a lot of work. Run around like, with the dog, but yeah. a lot of them are being sprayed with glyphosate and chemical, just Roundup, and it's like an awful, awful chemical causing all kinds of ecological destruction, and now a lot of research is coming out as far as internal, our, you know, the microbiome in our gut is directly correlated to the microbiome in the soil, and all yeah. that biology is really important, and uh, the science is really exciting, so. Um, I can tell getting... you're passionate about it, and just the short time, or the, the conversations that we've had, you've gotten me excited about it, so um, I really value all of the knowledge that you have, and I, I definitely wanted to be able to share you with our viewers, so thank you so much for coming today. I, I really appreciate you joining us. Um, we do have information about Nathan's website as well as some photos on our on the um, included on here on screen um, and how you can reach Nathan. If you're actually looking to offset and changing the economy our, in our changing economy, what you can do to help, I think this is one small way in which you can get involved with edible landscapes. Um, so thanks again. I appreciate you. Thank you for joining us today. You have t if you have tip ideas or topics for us or questions about um, your home, and uh, please email us at the email address on the screen. Uh, we want to earn the right to be your real estate concierge. And I also invite you to join our Be Home Facebook page. Uh, we have a ton of resources there. Again, I'm Kathleen Gano, and I'm signing off for today. Be well and live well. <music>